All right. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, talk of El Seminario. Today, we're happy to have Jesus Arroyo uh, from Mexico City to join us and talk to us about finding structure in brain networks. Just as a short uh, bio about Jesus, uh, he was born in Mexico City, where he did an undergraduate degree in applied mathematics and also in computer engineering, both at the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México also known as ITAM. After that, he moved to Ann Arbor to complete, complete a PhD in statistics at the University of Michigan, and then to Baltimore, where he worked as a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University and at the University of Maryland. Since 2021, he is working as an assistant professor in the Department of Statistics at Texas A&M, and he is interested in statistical network analysis, machine learning, and neuroimaging applications. So with that, uh, please uh, let me welcome Jesus. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and feel free to take it away. Um, hello, uh, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Claudia, for the invitation to present uh, here at the seminario. I'm very happy to present today. So I'm going to be talking about finding a structure in brain networks. So let me jump to the talk. Um, here. So well, first, what's a brain network? The idea of uh, this type of data is to represent the structure of the brain into a graph that has vertices representing either certain neurons of the brain or uh, brain regions, and then the edges are going to represent the connectivity of the brain. The idea of this type of data is to capture this uh, brain structure because essentially the brain is organized as a network. So uh, depending on the way that uh, neurons are organized and the, the way the neurons communicate, uh, they create all the functional uh, uh, brain structure. So, uh, well, in principle, ideally, we would like to have access to the neuronal map of the brain uh, with having uh, connections between neurons, which will give us uh, very detailed information about the brain. Here's one example with the C. elegans, which is this very small mouse, uh, very small worm here. And basically, uh, for this uh, animal, all the neurons have been mapped, and then there's a a well-known uh, structure of the brain uh, that is represented in this picture. Uh, however, for bigger animals like humans, for example, it's not possible to go to the neuronal uh, level. So in this case, uh, we need to use uh, brain images in order to uh, obtain some approximation of the structure of the brain and uh, get an idea of the connectivity. So here uh, in this example, I have some structural brain connectivity, which is obtained from diffusion magnetic resonance images or the MRI for short. And well, basically the idea here is that the person goes to scan, then uh, the scan takes a lot of images from uh, the human scope. And after that, uh, there's a lot of pre-processing going on to end up with a graph. This graph is going to represent uh, some regions of the brain, which are called regions of interest. Basically the brain is divided into hundreds or thousands of regions. And then uh, the connection between these regions uh, represented by nerve tracks is encoded in this network. So essentially that's one way of obtaining uh, connectivity of the brain. Alternatively, uh, one can study the functional connectivity, which basically measures the way in which uh, different regions of the brain activate. So the scans are going to measure our blood oxygenation levels at different times. And then if two regions are activating together, it suggests that uh, they are uh, connected in certain way. So uh, by calculating correlations or other types of dependence measures between these regions, we can obtain a network, which again, tells something about uh, the structure of the brain. So here, for example, we can see that the brain is clearly organized in different regions that are associated to different functions. Okay. Well, one of the nice features of having access to uh, brain networks is that we can uh, study uh, population properties of the brain. So in particular, uh, there are different questions of interest. For example, we may wonder what's the common structure in the brain, because essentially everybody shares the same anatomy, but we want to see which features are shared across uh, all humans or other types of species. We are also interested in understanding differences and similarities across people, across animals, or uh, across different types of brains, and also trying to predict uh, brain disorders or other conditions. And well, the challenges in statistics for uh, uh, analyzing this type of data is that in principle, well, we want to have some flexible interpretable models that can tell us um, some information useful for uh, us to interpret what's going on in the brain. So because this data is massive, uh, we have uh, 
hundreds or thousands of regions, and then that creates even thousands of millions of uh, connections between them. We want to reduce the dimensionality of this data set uh, in order to get something that we can understand and we can create inferences uh, for other problems. Uh, second challenge is that we want to get efficient computational methods because uh, the large magnitude of these uh, networks usually creates problems in computation. So we want to uh, have uh, tractable models that allow uh, to perform efficient computations and then we can obtain solutions that can tell us something about the brain. And finally, uh, we want to understand the theory behind these models and methods in order to understand when can we do inferences about uh, these uh, type of problems. So uh, one particular uh, model that uh, uh, we developed to study uh, this type of networks uh, basically has these two goals. On the one hand, we want to characterize the common vertex structure. We was one of the goals that I mentioned in the previous slide. But uh, we also want to understand the individual network variability. The goal basically is to uh, capture uh, in this model, we're going to use a common invariant subspace, which if you don't know what that means, uh, it doesn't matter too much, but the point is that uh, we want to have some common parameters that are going to be shared across all the networks. So in this picture here, I have basically uh, the connectivity of each network. And as you can see, they are divided into two groups. The groups are the same across the uh, different networks. And essentially that captures the idea that uh, the brain shares the same structure uh, for different people. But on the other hand, we also want to use uh, parameters that allow the brain to change uh, the connectivity from person to person. So well, that's basically the idea of the model. Uh, one of the nice features about this model is that we can perform efficient uh, inferences in order to estimate these parameters. So basically, uh, we can apply some uh, simple computational tools, uh, some linear algebra uh, tools known as eigen decompositions and singular value decompositions of uh, the adjacency matrices of these networks, which are going to tell us something about uh, the structure of the brain. In particular here, you can see that first, uh, we apply some uh, transformation to each of these networks, and this results uh, in a cloud of points that is representing uh, the structure of, of these uh, networks. So here in particular, we can see that points that are closer to each other in this representation basically represent vertices that uh, share a similar connectivity pattern. And after that, uh, we can apply another transformation to this data to obtain a single representation for all the networks in our collection. And this representation is going to be capturing information that is shared across all the individuals in our population. And well, uh, another goal is to understand the theory behind these methods because we want to understand in which cases we can achieve uh, good inferences. And basically we want to measure the error between the estimates that we get uh, using some data and the true parameters that uh, we assume are generating uh, these models. Also, in theory, uh, this works fine. In practice, uh, we need to be more careful to see whether these models uh, are a good description of the data or not. But well, in principle, we want to understand what the properties of the networks make this problem harder. Okay, well, so once we have uh, models and methods to study networks, we can apply it to uh, data sets. So for instance, here I have one example in the HNU1 brain study. So in this study, uh, 30 different subjects uh, had their brains scanned over a period of one month. So each person went to the scan 10 times and then that resulted in 300 different networks. Because we have multiple scans per people, we can ask different questions. The first question would be, what's the common structure that is shared across all of these networks? Because essentially we want to understand what is common in the human brain. But we also want to understand what, whether there are differences between these networks and whether these measurements that uh, were taken from each person can actually characterize the brain connectivity or if they are too similar and we cannot really distinguish any differences between them. So we apply the method that I showed you earlier. And the first thing that we did is to get a common representation of all of these networks. So here is a representation in a smaller dimensional space in which each point here is uh, related to one of the vertices of these networks, but this is shared across all the uh, participants in, in the study. So essentially what we can see in this representation is that um, the uh, vertices are located in this space uh, according to the anatomy of the brain. In particular, vertices that are in the same side of the brain are uh, close to each other, which is something 
reason about this very good representation of the brain because well essentially the brain is divided into two uh, sides and most of the connections happen between vertices in the same side but i mean one can also look at more detailed information about uh, these vertices to understand more in detail what type of regions uh, are forming the brain and how is that related to different brain activities and well so once we have some common representation that provides uh, good uh, information about the brain. We can also uh, try to understand how different the uh, networks from person to person are. So here I have in this plot uh, uh, points. Each of these points is represented one of these each of the networks in the previous slide, and the colors correspond to the different subjects. In this plot, I only have five subjects to show you an illustration, but essentially you can see a similar phenomenon. Uh, points corresponding to the same subject are closer to each other than with respect to other subjects, suggesting that, in fact, uh, the brain uh, connectivity can actually differentiate subjects, and basically this connectivity is different from person to person. We can even go further and apply some machine learning techniques in order to check whether these differences actually uh, allow us to discriminate between people, and in fact, we can see that with uh, very simple models that don't require a lot of parameters. We can achieve a good uh, classification, meaning that, in fact, it's possible to represent the brain in to some smaller structure that can actually characterize differences across subjects. Okay, so well, that's in principle a good thing because we have a model that can characterize the brain very well. But there are also other uh, questions of interest, and so for example here. Uh, we may also wonder whether uh, the brain connectivity can be used to, for example, diagnose uh, different brain disorders or where we can understand uh, changes from person to person that can tell us something about uh, conditions of a person or the way that the brain evolves or differences between species. So another task that we can do is to try to classify subjects corresponding to different classes. Here I'm using a different methodology. But essentially, the point is not only to predict the status of a brain network in order to detect whether a person may have some brain disorder or not, but we also want to identify which brain regions are more predictive of these conditions. So for that, uh, we develop a method that uh, tries to discriminate between these two classes of schizophrenic patients and healthy subjects. And we can see that, uh, well, in general, many methods are able to perform these tasks very accurately, meaning that in principle, it's possible to detect whether a person may have schizophrenia by just looking at the brain connectivity. But uh, also, if we put a little bit more uh, uh, structure into the methods to classify the brains, we can actually dis uh, cover some brain regions that may be more related to a different brain disorder. So for example, here, I have the, the points color in green, which were related to uh, schizophrenic patients. So essentially, these uh, regions in the brain are predictive of a schizophrenic per person, and they may suggest that part of the brain disorder may be related to these brain regions. Okay, so well, that's uh, one possible question that we can ask about brain networks, but in general, there are multiple other uh, types of problems uh, in which we can use uh, brain network data in order to identify structure in the brain. Uh, one question of interest is graph matching when we want to align vertices across two different networks or more than two different networks. And this may be useful when we're comparing uh, brains from, let's say, humans to other types of species like uh, monkeys or other animals, because in that case, we're not going to have exactly the same anatomy from uh, species to species, but we can still try to identify alignments that allow us to compare the brains. We can also try other problems such as community detection in order to partition the brain into smaller regions that are related to certain uh, characteristics of, of the network. Um, we also have uh, hypothesis testing questions in which we want to identify differences between groups of networks. For example, we may wonder whether uh, people at a certain age have certain connectivities compared to people uh, as they get older. And for that, we need uh, to do careful analysis of these networks. And finally, we also uh, want to do data integration in which we want to combine information from different sources. So for example, as I showed you earlier, we may have structural connectivity indicating uh, physical connections between regions. And we also have 
functional activations of these regions. So we want to integrate these data sets in order to find more structure and find differences and similarities between the two different structures of the brain. Okay, so these are uh, these questions are applicable to any other types of networks. And in general, the methods that I presented here can also be applied to different domains. So here I have one example of a similar methodology that uh, was applied to a time series of flights between US airports. And essentially uh, with this, first of all, uh, we can partition the uh, map into different regions that, that share similar connectivities in the sense that maybe airports from here are going to behave in a similar way to connect to airports in other regions. And we can also study the individual parameters in order to see how they evolve over time. So for instance, we can see that the connectivity of all the networks decreased a lot during 2020, which is something that we observed because of COVID, of course. And then well, we can compare how this connectivity is changing in the different regions of the US as COVID uh, evolved. Okay, well, so that's basically uh, all about the first part of the talk. And well, I want to acknowledge all my collaborators and these are the main references uh, the, uh, of the talk today. So now uh, let me move on to the second part, which um, uh, should I stop here for questions or should I move on to the second part? Sir, uh, let's uh, go ahead and we can leave questions to the end. Okay, perfect. So for the last part, I'm going to talk about uh, September in Mexico City. Um, so well, basically, uh, I want to talk about this topic because of some things that happened this year. But so just to start to give you some context, in Mexico City in September, uh, we have the National Independence Day celebrations. And basically, well, well, we can see a lot of things going on in the city. Uh, uh, buildings are decorated with Mexican topics like the heroes of the national independence, people putting their houses flags in order to celebrate the independence. And we can also see uh, restaurants or people in their houses make uh, special types of food for the celebration, like chiles and nogada here. So uh, on the other hand, in Mexico City, uh, this season is also known as the earthquake season because uh, several earthquakes have happened in September in the in recent years. In particular, uh, uh, some particular day, September 19, had three earthquakes happening recently. In 1985, there was a very huge earthquake that affected a lot of people uh, multiple people died and several buildings collapsed. So this was a well-known day uh, for people in Mexico City. But then uh, in 2017, there was another huge earthquake happening on the same day. So that started uh, it started to make people think that there was something special about this day. And actually uh, this year, uh, the same date, September 19, there was another huge earthquake happening. So at this point, people were uh, wondering whether there was actually some phenomena happening in that day that was creating more earthquakes. And some media or some people in the news reported that it was actually something very unlikely to see, which again made people think that um, this day is special and we need to be more careful because it may be more likely to observe earthquakes on that day. So, well, since this talk uh, was related to statistics, I wanted to put some statistics here and some statistical problems to or try to see whether it's actually more likely to observe earthquakes on that day. So, well, we can go to this website to get an idea of how many earthquakes we have observed in recent years. And especially uh, since 1900, there has been 68 earthquakes happening with uh, seven plus magnitude uh, over the whole period of time. Uh, it doesn't matter the month. So then, one may wonder whether it's more likely to observe earthquakes happening in September, or in particular, whether uh, there's a higher probability of having earthquakes in September 19. And well, you may think that well, having three earthquakes is something very likely to happen in the same day, but this is the same as the verdict paradox, which is a very well-known problem in probability, which essentially, it's a paradox because although this seems unlikely to happen, if you calculate the probability carefully, uh, here I'm just using Wolfram alpha to uh, obtain the value of this probability. But you can see that this probability is actually uh, not that small. And it's not that unlikely if there were 60 earthquakes in total, that three of them were going to happen in the same day. So in particular, uh, with these numbers, 
we get that the probability is 0 0.28, which is close to one four. So this is something not unlikely to see. And if we keep waiting for a longer period of time, we may see other days that have two or three airports happening. And we can do similar analysis to check whether it's more likely to occur earthquakes in September or not. But again, uh, if we conduct this analysis carefully, we are not going to observe some statistical significance in the occurrence of earthquakes in September in Mexico City. So, well, just to summarize this second part of the talk is that in Mexico City, it's significantly more likely to see Mexican food, Mexican decorations or fireworks, but earthquakes are not more likely. And that's all. And thank you.